2019 is coming to a close, and after reviewing almost 70 different laptops on the channel this year, it's time to separate the winners from the losers. Let's set the scene by covering the new hardware that was released throughout 2019. Right at the start of the year in January, Nvidia launched RTX graphics for laptops. And although ray tracing in itself still feels like early days all this time later, the 2060, 2070 and 2080 represent the higher end of the market. By late April, the GTX 16 series had also joined the lineup, filling in the mid-range, while the 1050 remained at the lower end. Around the same time in late April, Intel also launched their 9th gen mobile CPUs. And although the i5-9300H and i7-9750H weren't offering much extra compared to the 8th gen, this did move the i9 options up to 8 cores 16 threads. AMD also launched some new mobile chips this year in January, and although they seemed to have a bit more of a presence compared to last year, I was still only to get my hands on a couple of Ryzen 7 3750H laptops. This is their best mobile CPU at the moment, although it gets beaten in most cases by the last gen i5-8300H. There are rumours that AMD will have some interesting new laptop parts at CES 2020 in a few weeks, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel as I'll be heading there to cover all the new stuff. Otherwise, AMD also launched the 5500M just recently, and although it fills the big gap between the GTX 1650 and 1660 Ti, it's not currently available in many different models, and the ones that are available aren't that competitive in terms of price. Alright, with that quick 2019 hardware recap out of the way, let's get into what I thought were the best laptops of 2019. This video is largely going to be based on my personal opinion after my experience testing out almost 70 laptops this year. Everyone has unique preferences and different requirements, so what I'm saying here are by no means definitive answers. So definitely let me know your favourites or what you'd pick differently in the comments. Let's start off with the best value gaming laptop. Basically here I'm considering laptops that have a lot to offer for the price that are still able to handle pretty much anything. The Lenovo Wi-Fi 40 is a strong contender, although it's going to depend on your region. In the US there are cheaper options, however here in Australia and other regions it's priced extremely competitively and definitely worth checking out. Despite being around the 1200 US dollar price point, we still have the option of disabling Optimus to increase gaming performance. And with a more professional looking design that doesn't scream I'm a gamer, it's a good option for a lot of people if you're willing to deal with its massive power brick. For most people though, I'm going to give the win of best value gaming laptop of 2019 to the Acer Helios 300. In the US, it launched at around 1200 US dollars, but can now regularly be found for under 1100 US dollars. On Black Friday, it went on sale for 930 US dollars which is honestly a crazy deal for a laptop with an i7-9750H CPU, GTX 1660 Ti graphics and dual channel memory. The Helios is tuned well out of the box too. It's undervolted, has an above average CPU power limit and enabling turbo mode also overclocks the graphics. You can of course make these tweaks to many other laptops with the same specs for similar results, but for the majority of people that just want to turn on their laptop and game, I think the Helios 300 was the best option for 2019 for the money. Shout out to the Clevo NH58RCQ, which is sold in Australia through Metabox. Like the Wi-Fi 540, it's hundreds of dollars cheaper than the Helios here and in many other countries. The same chassis is resold around the world under different brands and definitely worth a look at, as it offers some of the best cooling and performance for the money. If you need extra features, then the Electronics Mag 15 or Vapor 15 from Aftershock which I reviewed is a solid choice. You're paying more to get Thunderbolt, big battery, SD card slot and mechanical keyboard, so it's not quite as good in terms of value compared to the cheaper Helios with same specs from a pure gaming perspective, but if you also do other tasks alongside gaming then there's a lot of value on offer in that package. Otherwise, if you really need G-Sync, the Lenovo Y740 is worth a mention as it was on the lower cost side at around $1400 US dollars compared to other G-Sync laptops I tested in 2019. The beast mode category is for the heavier thick boys that offer the best possible performance at any cost. 
The Alienware 51M is a strong contender with i9 9900K CPU, RTX 2080 graphics, G-Sync, and it promises future upgradability. Although it's yet to be seen how that will go until we have next-gen hardware available. Overall, the 51M is a powerful gaming laptop. But unfortunately, the software experience alone was enough for me to not want to buy this laptop. Basically, the Alienware software was a nightmare to work with, to the point where it was significantly reducing performance. Apparently, some issues have been addressed with updates, so your mileage may vary. However, I still get comments on the original review of people with the same issue. So for those reasons, it's out. The MSI GT76 has the same i9 9900K and RTX 2080, and while a fairly impressive machine, it has no G-Sync or MUX switch, meaning you're stuck with Optimus and as a result lower gaming performance. For the amount of money you're paying, I think that's a bit of a kick in the guts. But if you can get past that, I'd certainly prefer it over the 51M. The Aorus 17 was impressive. It's got an i9 9980HK and RTX 2080 graphics, but is noticeably smaller in size compared to the others while being $400 to $500 less. In some tests, it doesn't quite perform as well as the others, but it's also a fair amount cheaper. It's got a mechanical keyboard, 240Hz 1080p screen, and the important MUX switch so you can swap between Optimus and G-Sync. The ASUS mothership also offered extreme levels of performance, with an i9 9980HK CPU that comes with liquid metal and RTX 2080 graphics. It's unique in that it has all the heat generating components placed behind the screen, allowing it to more easily pull in air, keep cool, and perform better compared to a traditional laptop design. I guess technically it's not a laptop and more of a desktop replacement, still a worthy mention, but given it's around $2,000 extra for not much difference in performance, it's out. The Clevo P775TM was one of the first laptops I tested in 2019, and it's another with a 9900K and RTX 2080. It's a little hard for me to fairly compare it with the others as I tested it more than 6 months earlier and I changed my games over time. But just look at the price. It's around $2,700 US dollars, $1,000 less than the Aorus, or $1,400 less than the GT76, yet still with G-Sync, and a similar difference with the 51M but without the software headache. So this is the winner of the Beast Mode category. Also shout out to the Clevo P750TM, which is the smaller 15 inch version for a similar price. Thin and powerful laptops typically come at an extra cost compared to slightly thicker options. However, many people are happy to pay more money for a lighter laptop that can still perform well enough. So let's see what 2019 had to offer in this category. I think the first one I tested was the ASUS Zephyrus S GX701, and this really set the precedent for a while. With i7 CPU, up to RTX 2080 Max-Q graphics, and a MUX switch so you have the option of swapping between Optimus and G-Sync, the GX701 was one of the best performing gaming laptops I tested all year. This was all while running on the cooler side and being just 1.87cm thick. The key downsides include that it's got some memory soldered to the motherboard, so upgrades are more limited. And despite being a larger 17 inch laptop, they only managed to fit one M.2 slot inside. The keyboard is also pushed right to the front, with the touchpad crammed in on the right. This is part of the trade off for the good cooling as air is pulled in above the keyboard. It's also missing Thunderbolt. When you consider the price tag, I think many people expect all the bells and whistles. Next up was the Razorblade Pro 17. Another 17 inch laptop that's a little thicker than the Zephyrus, but has the keyboard and touchpad in the normal spot. I tested the 2070 Max-Q model, but found it very interesting that Razer are running it seemingly out of Nvidia spec at 100 watts, which results in seriously impressive performance for that level of hardware, beating out many 2080 Max-Q machines. The cooling here is also a little unique. At the expense of battery, they've included a couple of extra fans down the front. The smaller 15 inch Razer Blade could also be an option. However, the power limit of the graphics isn't boosted like the larger Pro model, so performance is down even with a higher end GPU. The MSI GS75 was another thin and powerful 17 inch gaming laptop that I tested this year with the 2080 Max Q graphics at just under 1.9cm thick, only a little more than the GX701. 
The build quality wasn't quite as good as the previous two. However, at least the internal space is useful, as MSI offer 3 M.2 slots here. If you want to upgrade the memory or anything else though, you'll need to remove the motherboard as it's upside down, which can make some upgrades a little tricky. There's also the smaller 15 inch version, the GS65. However, I didn't get the chance to test that out this year. There's also the Acer Triton 500, thinnest of them all at 1.79cm thick. Unfortunately, I only had the 2060 configuration to test, but it's similar to the GS65 and GS75 in that it's got an upside down motherboard, making upgrades annoying. The higher end models do have G-Sync though, the build quality is nice, and it's got Thunderbolt, so could be worth checking out. I've got to give the win of thin and powerful to the ASUS Zephyrus S GX502. Not only is it a smaller 15 inch laptop, but with RTX 2070 Max-P graphics, it's outperforming the other options. It's got a MUX switch, so it can swap over to the Nvidia graphics from Optimus for increased performance and G-Sync. Unlike the GX701, which was only ever so slightly thinner, it doesn't suffer from front keyboard placement. To be fair, this extreme performance in a small space does come at the expense of higher temperatures, but it's undeniably offering excellent performance for the size. If thermals are a priority, then be prepared for a larger 17-inch machine like the GX701. The new Gigabyte Aero 17 also deserves a mention. It's a little thicker at 2.1cm, but unlike the other options mentioned so far, it can be specced up to an i9 CPU, which would give it an edge in multi-core performance. It also had significantly better battery life than the others, and only the Aero and Razer Blade offer Thunderbolt out of these options. People get triggered when the word budget doesn't meet what they can personally afford. Given entry level gaming laptops tend to start around the 600 to 700 US dollar price point, this is what I'll be considering. Unfortunately, I haven't tested too many budget gaming laptops out this year, so choice is limited. Most companies seem to send out their better options. But hopefully as the channel grows next year, I'll just be able to buy more of these myself in future. I was initially interested in the new Dell G3 when it was announced at Computex in June. However, in order to keep it cool enough, Dell run it with a lower CPU power limit. At the time I reviewed it, there were cheaper options that would outperform it. However, I had quite a few comments saying that there have been good deals on the G3, so it's probably worth a look at. When I bought the Lenovo L340 just to review it, I was sad to find out that it only had single channel memory. Despite this, it's still able to play most games at lower settings without issue with the 1650 config I tested, and it goes for around $720, $80 less than Dell's G3 for that spec. If you're willing to step down to the 1050, you can still play less demanding games no problem. Then you're looking at closer to $600. The Acer Nitro 5 has some good options. Granted, this one is a refurb, but for $550 US dollars, it's looking okay for the money compared to the others. The new options are a bit more though. You could get a G3 with the same specs as the Nitro 5 for $40 less. But when the L340 is so much less than both with similar specs, even without the dual channel memory, I think I've got to give the win to the L340 as much as it pains me. It also doesn't look like a gaming laptop, which I'm also a fan of. If you're happy to go for a refurbished machine though, the Nitro 5 at Newegg with option to go dual channel for $550 but same CPU and GPU as the entry level L340 looks like a good pick out of these limited options. There are of course cheaper laptops that can still play lightweight games okay. I just haven't had the chance to test any this year to discuss. Twenty nineteen also saw the introduction of Nvidia Studio laptops for content creators at Computex in June. At first, I was a bit skeptical and thought we'd just see existing laptops rebranded with the Studio sticker stuck on. And well, for the most part, that's exactly what we got. With that said though, I think this category has at least pushed many companies towards considering content creation more, so I'm hopeful we'll see some good options next year. We also saw the rise of 15 inch OLED panels this year, which I think is a great option for creators due to the high colour gamut, brightness and contrast ratio. I personally use the Gigabyte Aero 15X for 4K editing when I'm travelling. However, it's definitely not without its flaws, including running hot and an annoying to press keyboard. I was happy to see that Gigabyte addressed these problems at Computex 2019 with the new OLED model. The cooling was greatly improved and the keyboard redone. 
All the same key features I need are still there, including Thunderbolt 3, UHS-2 SD card slot, and large 94 watt hour battery. With the addition of an OLED screen, I thought this would be an easy win for me, but that wasn't the case. The Intel Tongfang chassis sold as the MAG-15 by Electronics in the US, Vapor-15 by Aftershock here in Australia, or Fusion-15 by XMG in Europe also has a lot of these key features. Granted, without the option of an OLED screen. However, it does have a mechanical keyboard. The SD card slot also isn't UHS-2 like the Aero, but based on the raw performance in games, it's generally a little ahead. And in raw CPU performance at stock, it's ahead too, though by undervolting and boosting power limits, they were quite close with an edge to the Aero. I'm probably going to get some hate for this, but I wouldn't personally consider the Dell XPS 15 when there are more powerful options like the MAG-15 and Aero 15 for less money, similar features, and more power. Overall, the XPS 15 has a high level of build quality, is available with OLED screen like the Aero and Thunderbolt 3, large battery, and SD card slot, which both the Aero and MAG have. Unfortunately, the XPS 15 maxes out with GTX 1650 graphics, while the others start with 1660 Ti, and that's around 50% faster. During multi-core workloads, the CPU in the XPS runs at 15 watts, while the others have no issue running beyond 45 watts. Basically, you're paying more for less performance with the XPS 15. The ASUS ZenBook Pro Duo was another very interesting option, as it's got two screens with up to i9-9980HK CPU and RTX 2060 to back it up. If you need a touchscreen you can just draw on, or more screen space, then the Pro Duo could be what you're after. Personally, I'd prefer performance over things like a second screen. I could always bring a portable external screen and have it off to the side, without paying the $2500 US dollar entry price for the Pro Duo. If you're after something lighter, the MSI Prestige 15 impressed me with its new 10th gen CPU, putting it ahead of the i7-9750H in many tests. However, as a result of the thinner chassis, it maxes out with the GTX 1650 Max-Q graphics, so it depends if that's adequate for what you're doing. I'm having a hard time picking a winner out of the MAG-15 and Aero-15. It's super close. The key difference is that the Aero is available with OLED screen and faster SD slot, but I personally prefer the design and build quality of the MAG. I could really go either way, but I'm going to give the win to the MAG-15. It's not a big deal if I need to spend a little longer copying files off my SD card, and I'm still not sure I like the reflective PWM OLED panels, though the colours and contrast were amazing. Both machines are great, and I can happily recommend either. However, the Aero does cost $100 to $200 more, so it depends how much you value OLED. I also wanted to spend some time looking at the new things different companies are trying out. It's always interesting to see new ideas rather than the same old designs with small refinements. The most interesting laptops for me in 2019 in this regard were the ASUS ZenBook Pro Duo and the non-pro version, both of which have two screens. ASUS have moved the keyboard down and used the extra space to include a touchscreen which runs along the entire length of the laptop. HP also have a dual screen laptop, and although I haven't had the chance to personally test it yet, it seems to have a lot of wasted space on the left and right hand sides. The ZenBook Duo uses all available space, and is one of the few options that offers extra screen real estate. Next up is the ASUS Mothership. Sure it's crazy, and something only the 0.1% will buy, but I've got to give the design props. The unique design of pushing the hot components behind the screen to improve cooling is an interesting idea, and one that already seems to have trickled down to other ASUS laptops from their Pro Art series. I'm interested to see if more laptops incorporate this in the future, as it can offer much better cooling. The Acer Triton 900 has an interesting hinged screen design, and although I'm still in the process of reviewing it, so far I haven't found it to be too practical, but still an interesting idea. Acer also have the Helios 700 with keyboard that slides down to improve cooling, and while they haven't sent one over to me yet, it looked promising based on my time with it at Computex earlier this year. There wasn't much else that stood out to me this year that I've tested. I'll give a quick mention to the new Razer Blade Stealth which I'm currently reviewing, as it's a 13 inch thin and light laptop that still manages to pack GTX 1650 Max-Q graphics. 
While this isn't anything crazy, in the past 13 inch laptops have been limited to MX150 or 250 graphics. So this was a nice change for those that are willing to pay more for ultra portability. In terms of a product you can actually buy today and is likely to have the most use, I'm going to give the win of best innovation to ASUS for the Duo series laptops with two screens. As out of these options, I think it will be of most use to most people and they're implementing it well today. A best laptops of 2019 video wouldn't be complete without some acknowledgements to the losers. Unlike last year, there was nothing that really stood out as completely terrible, so I'll just highlight some of the disappointments. A quick shout out to the Dell G5 for being a furnace. It's not too bad overall for the price, but man, it ran up to 100 degrees Celsius on the CPU under CPU workloads, ouch. The MSI Alpha 15 also needs a mention. Don't get me wrong, I really like that there's finally a new gaming laptop that offers an all AMD solution for those that want it. The main problem I have with it is the price. At $1100 US dollars, you can get an Acer Helios 300 which will easily outperform it in all regards, so it just doesn't make sense. That said, it is currently on sale though, which is nice, but I think it still needs a price cut for the level of performance on offer. I am however happy to report that with the new Radeon 2020 software, the driver issues I experienced when updating have been fixed. I was disappointed by the Lenovo L340. Opening it up after buying it to see single channel memory cut me pretty deep. That simple change could have made it so easy to recommend at its price point. It was almost the chosen one. Despite that though, for the price, compared to the competition, it doesn't look too bad. I guess we can't have everything in life. For the most part, it seems pretty difficult to buy something that's going to completely suck in 2019, at least out of what I've personally tested. It mostly comes down to price and how much different laptops cost compared to others. That's it, my picks for some of the best laptops 2019 had to offer. I've only picked from the laptops that I've personally had for testing. Unfortunately I wasn't able to get my hands on everything. Make sure you let me know what your favourite laptops of the year were in the comments. And if you're new to the channel, you'll definitely want to get subscribed for my upcoming CES 2020 coverage where we'll get a first look at the new laptops we'll see next year.